question, who are activist investors? Yeah. They're, for example, groups of investors. But on your website follow of your company, mm. we also see that individuals can apply or even pension funds. So are these also activist investors sometimes? Yeah, we are uh, a group of green shareholders, as we call mm -hmm. ourselves, green shareholders in the oil and gas industry. And we have 4,700 um, investors, uh, shareholders. So, so why uh, would, for example, pension funds like to invest in green energy? What's in it for them? Because they, uh, in very short, they have a very high incentive to stop climate change because they're the assets, the billions they are responsible for, uh, are in great danger if climate change gets out of hand. Is this also because of that long-term vision? Yeah, of course. Th this is a, if they look at the next generation, yeah. they, look, they, they have to make sure this money is still there in 50 years. When you get your, uh, <laughs> you pensions. might get a pension. <laughs> um, so they have a long-term horizon. They want to make sure this money stays valuable and they know that in a world economy with devastating climate change, they cannot make a decent profit. They may even lose, lose money uh, because devastating climate change, so let's say an above two degrees world will cost far too much money for them. And they cannot, the world economy will stall and these, these companies, they invest money and they, this money grows approximately with the world economy. So if the world economy stalls or, or, or even uh, shrinks, uh, they lose money. So that's the reason they want to stop climate change. So you also previously mentioned um, agenda setting already. Yeah. And we were wondering, because we talked about who these activist investors are, so yeah. pension funds, groups, individuals. Mm. We were wondering how do activist investors concretely influence a company's decision? Um, yeah, by making very visible, visible what their choices yeah. are. So that's the only thing we do. We make very visible what the choices of the oil majors are, the oil and gas companies, and very visible what their investors, their shareholders, their owners think of it. That's so the only thing we that? did. That by putting it on the agenda of the shareholder meeting. So since 2016, we put on the agenda of Shell, and this year we also put it on the agendas of other oil companies. Such as? Uh, uh, such as this year, Equinor, BP, oh, okay. and yeah. Chevron. Yeah. Um, so, but uh, we started with Shell a couple of years ago with a simple question uh, or with a simple phrase, shareholders support uh, the company to commit to the Paris Climate Agreement. And uh, the company can do so by setting targets that are aligned with the Paris Climate Agreement. Very simple and um, fair ask, we thought. Um, and then it's very visible that the choices of these companies are different and also visible that the choices of their shareholders are different. And in that way, you, uh, you show that there's a small part of the, sh part of the shareholder that really wants change. But you need a shareholder resolution, you need to put it on the agenda to make it visible. Okay. And would you say that, I mean, you, you said that they don't, I, I guess, not really listen to you, mm -hmm. or they don't always want to listen to you? No, they're, they're not used to shareholder activism in this way. Oh yeah? They're used to very aggressive shareholders. Okay. We are very friendly shareholders. We <laughs> say we support you and we mean it. We think that these companies who've been successful in oil and gas for over a hundred years mm -hmm. really need to change and they really need the support of their shareholders to do so. So that's what we organize. We say yeah. we, or so you, we suppose you want to change. Of course they say yes, yes, we want to be a force for good. We are such a huge global company. We have a global impact. We want to be a force for good. Okay, but you need your shareholder support. We're going to help you with that. We put it on your agenda and we phrase it very friendly. Shareholders support you to change course and then shareholders can vote for it. And apparently um, in sh the case of Shell, 6% of the shareholders voted yeah. for it. This sounds very small, but normally 99.9% .9 votes with management and management advised their shareholders to vote against it. So when 6% votes for a resolution like that and another 7% abstains, so this means that only the company only has the support of 87% of the shareholders. That's a very strong signal. And with Shell, apparently, it was strong enough to make them uh, change and, and make them set a climate ambition. Yeah. And on your website, you also mentioned that they do actually listen to you, but they don't listen to the government. So we were wondering, just, just out, of, out of curiosity, yeah. why would Shell, such a large company, not listen to the government and rather listen to an activist investment group? Yeah, um, I think these companies, these global companies, 
all, most multinationals are more powerful than many governments. Yeah. And in the Netherlands, the proof is on the table since the last government coalition agreement. Dividend tax. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wanted a dividend tax to be scripted in the Netherlands. Nobody voted for it. The public was against it, and it was in the, in the government agreement. Yeah. And it was only because of the very strong lobby power of Unilever and Shell. Our prime minister felt it in his... Uh, I can't translate it. In his veins? Yeah. No, he felt it yeah, in yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the depth of uh, his body. He didn't listen to his photos. What's the translation for Vezels? Uh, yeah. But uh, <laughs> our prime minister said, I feel it everywhere in my, my whole body. We need to do this, although uh, <laughs> all photos, all the, the, the Dutch public is against this. So we have to do this. Finally, it was this, this whole idea was stopped because British shareholders said to Unilever, no, you're not going to move your headquarters to the Netherlands. So British shareholders had more influence over Unilever, uh, mm -hmm. had more influence over our prime minister than the Dutch voters. Uh, so and I think that goes for a lot of co uh, companies. These, these, com these companies are so uh, worldwide, so global, that they are more powerful than most companies. And the only entity they have to listen to are their owners, their shareholders. So right so now we're talking to someone more powerful than Mark Rutte. <laughs> <laughs> That's very nice. <laughs> nice I, to know. Uh, I, 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 I think I can honestly say that I have more influence, that Follow This has more influence over Shell than, uh, than the Dutch government. Yeah, that's right. Oh, you yeah. heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, thanks for the question. But yeah. I, I think that's really true. We are the yeah. most influential shareholder uh, at the moment. Okay. Well, we see that maybe because of this influentialness, activist investment is getting increasingly more popular. So we saw that in 2017, activist investors poured more than $60 billion into nearly 200 companies, which was twice as much in 2016. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we also see that 2018 again broke all the records. Yeah. So how do you explain this surge in popularity of activist investments? Yeah, uh, depends on what kind of activist investments you look at. Uh, there, there are a lot mm. of short Climate there activist investments. Yeah, uh, uh, I mean, there are a lot of short-term, financial-driven activist investors, but when you look at the climate uh, activism, yeah, that's getting bigger and bigger, and I think more and more people realize that this is the only way to stop these companies. We have to realize that this oil industry can make or break the Paris Climate Agreement. At the moment, they're on a collision course with Paris. They still want to... Uh, explore for more oil and gas, they still want to extract more oil and gas, they still want to grow, they still want to put more CO2 in the air. So we need to stop them and the only way to stop them is by uh, making sure they, uh, they stop exploring for more oil and gas and start pouring all these billions into f looking for new business models. All right, but I, th yeah, I, think, I think that's a very interesting point, but we also, you mentioned this in a talk show as well, hmm where you talk about the domino effect. Would you say that, um, I mean, a recent su study by the University of Manchester saw that there is an increase in activist investing investment groups in the UK and the US specifically mm -hmm. because of this domino effect, out of fear that um, companies, so companies change their behavior out of fear that activist investors will get to them as well. Yeah. Do you think that this is visible in the Netherlands as well? Now in the Netherlands, uh, the problem in the Netherlands is that the threshold for filing a shareholder resolution is, is much higher yeah. than in the UK. Uh, to give the example of Shell, in the UK we needed 5 million in shares in Shell. And we managed to get them together with 10, uh, let's say, let's call them uh, idealistic entrepreneurs who, especially for this, bought five, a half a million euros in shares in Shell, so we ended up with 5 million. Um, in the Netherlands you need 5%. Yeah. Uh, so in the case of Shell, that's over 10 billion. Um, so that's one of the reasons that uh, that is not so popular in the Netherlands. Um, because uh, the threshold is too high and companies are very much protected in the Netherlands uh, for shareholders. That's, that's yeah. We just talked about it. That's, ex that's the reason Shell and Unilever want to, be, want to put their headquarters in the Netherlands because they're so much protected against uh, shareholder, act uh, shareholder, not only shareholder activism, but let's say shareholder influence in general. Okay, so we don't really feel this do domino effect here Right in the UK, yet. it's getting popular. Uh, in Norway, where the threshold is low, it's getting popular. Uh, but in uh, countries like the Netherlands, France, and Italy, the threshold is far too high. Um, so you, 
uh, you need billions uh, to file shareholder resolutions. Yeah. And do you think that if follow this grows even more, then th then we will feel it here? I think if follow this even, uh, my dream is that we can also lobby mm -hmm. uh, with governments, especially the Dutch government, to make it easier to file shareholder resolutions because we've shown how effective they can be. And we are lucky that Shell is a Dutch Anglo company. So we could, I go to London every year to, to file the resolution. Uh, I couldn't go to The Hague because uh, of Dutch law. So uh, I think it now we've shown how influential uh, this, this can be and how much it, how helpful it is for companies to, to, uh, to have shareholders who look at the long term. I think for the Netherlands it would also be a good idea. But then we have to expand and we have to have a also lobby power in The Hague <laughs> to, uh, to explain how effective and how important this is. Well, thanks very much for, I think, introducing the audience to activist investment. But now that we've learned more about that, we also want to learn more about you as a person. So you've been a journalist for your entire life and then suddenly decided to become an activist investor. Why yeah. did you make this change? I'd made a big change before, so I knew I could do it. Uh, <laughs> what I, big change? I, I'm an engineer by education. No. I, I worked as a sales manager for 10 years and then I decided to become a journalist. Um, after seeing the movie of Al Gore and Inconvenient Truth, <laughs> um, I suddenly realized that I had been 12 years a mechanical engineer and had never bothered about CO2. So I was, I was educated to design machines who put CO2 in the air and I didn't bother about, uh, about the result. You, you both have probably been gr grow up with the idea of climate change. We, uh, we really had to be woken up. So, but as soon as you are you are awake and you realize, okay, there's something going on. What can I do about it? I thought, okay, as a journalist, as an energy journalist, I can write about it. I can write about energy, about fossil fuels. Um, uh, I can write about climate change and, and in that way contribute uh, to, uh, to change. So I did that for uh, also like seven, eight years. And then I came with the idea of follow this. I saw that, I thought my influence as a, as a journalist was mm -hmm too little. I was not, uh, I was not a, a very influential journalist. So I decided, okay, that, that could be something else. Um, and now you're uh, nearly as uh, yeah, influential. At, at, at in as a certain Margaret moment, <laughs> uh, yeah, as at a certain moment, I've, I published my, let's say, my fifth opinion piece, mm -hmm. um, explaining very clearly how promising a future without fossil fuels uh, would be, how logical it would be for companies like Shell to to change and um, and sometimes I ended that story with something like uh, Shell, if you or Shell, another oil company, if you don't change, you will be the Kodak of the 21st century. Because I think that's really uh, where we are at this moment. The yeah. technology is there. The sun delivers enough energy to power the world economy within an hour for a whole year. So there's enough there's enough energy. We have to convert it to to uh, usable energy. But the technology is there, so uh, we only have to find a new business model. But after writing now for the for the 10th time, you will be the codec of the 21st century. For a moment, I thought, okay, in 20 years from now, Shell, Exxon, uh, they will go bankrupt, mm. and I'll be on national television at the 8 o'clock news <laughs> explaining how this all happened, and I could say, I told you so. <laughs> uh, only my wife said, okay, I'm not going to watch that. I don't like it. Now what did she say? She said, men who say, I told you so are not sexy. <laughs> so I had to think of something else. And then I thought, okay, Shell will never listen to Greenpeace. but n doesn't listen to governments. It's the other way around. I didn't know about the dividend tax yet then. But, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, who does Shell listen to? Only to the shareholders. And, uh, so we have and, and I thought the shareholders are pension funds, long-term focus. So the pension funds need to change them. Then, then I started writing that down. They also didn't listen, then I thought, okay, <laughs> then I have to organize it myself. So uh, I had to start a movement of green shareholders, and, and uh, we started it in 2015. And the only thing you have to do to get something like this off the ground is be very visible. So I thought, how can I be visible? I have to make it easy to, to join. So everybody on our website could buy one share in Shell, mm. 30 euros. Uh, you're the owner of Shell. You're the green. You're a green shareholder. Um, you send an email to. We auto automated that. Everybody who joined sent an email to Ben van Beurden, the CEO of Shell, saying, "Hi Ben, I'm your newest shareholder. <laughs> um, 
Um, you can change the world. You have 25 billion to spend. You have a lot of intelligent people. I'm your shareholder to give you support to change course. Uh, you have my support. That's what we always put a lot of emphasis on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then people could put it on Facebook and, and LinkedIn and, uh, and their friends would see, hey, wha what's, what's going on? Uh, Sarah and Carly, did they, <laughs> did they buy <laughs> shares in Shell? What, what's going on? <laughs> and, and they would think, okay, green share in Shell, that's a good idea. So that's how we grew the movement. Uh -huh. uh, so I could go to the shareholder meeting in 2015 uh, and talking in the shareholder meeting, everybody can stand behind the microphone and ask a question as a shareholder. And normally they can just say, okay, thank you for your question. We will give it the attention it deserves and move on. Um, and uh, so I, I was able to go there, be very visible saying, okay, uh, Dear Ben van Beurden, here I am. I'm here on behalf of, uh, of uh, 300 shareholders. They only had, everybody had one share, but I'm here on, <laughs> on, on, on behalf of 300. They sent you emails uh -huh. and he uh, finally replied, yeah, I read them all. <laughs> um, so he was aware of what, what we were doing. And I said, okay, and we've, we've, we support you to, uh, to change. And, that's and then you get visible and, uh, and then you get more support. So now yeah. we have almost 5,000. Uh, so, uh, people are joining every day. Um. Yeah, but just wondering, because you have a background as a journalist as well, yeah. do you th and you just talked about visibility. Is it also important for you to get media recognition? I don't need recognition, I, I want results. Mm -hmm. uh, some investors, some oil companies once have offered me, okay, if you stop now, we will recognize you. And yeah, I said, <laughs> okay, sorry, I, I, I need results. We need results. Yeah. Um, but um, it's important to be, it's very important for the investors to know that they have to explain their voting behavior, their attitude towards the oil industry and the media. Otherwise they can just keep on doing engagement. Uh, when I started this in 2015, uh, what I heard a lot from big investors, and these are people who, who manage billions um, I said, what do you do? So I read on your website, you think climate change is the mo most important issue at the moment. You think it should be shopped, stopped. What does it mean for your shares in, in fossil fuel companies? Are you going to sell them or are you going to use your influence? And the answer was always, we do engagement. What's that? Yeah, we talk with them behind closed doors. That's the best way to get them moving. Yeah, so and you want results, right? Yeah, we want you results. You don't want results, just yeah. acknowledgement. And therefore we were wondering, yeah. Uh, because Sarah also spoke to you during her preparations yeah. for the Marianne van Loon interview. How has Shell concretely changed as a result of your efforts? So what are the results of Follow This? Okay, the results are that Shell is the only oil major in the world that has an ambition to decrease their CO2 emissions, not only for their operations, because that's what a lot of oil companies promise, but also for their products. So Shell, and that's really an a groundbreaking step. Shell has taken responsibility for the emissions of their product. So this means that they recognize we are an energy company and we should transition to uh, renewable sources. And, and that's really uh, a result of the support for our shareholder resolutions. What happened in 2017, we put it on the agenda again. Shell said, you're asking something that is unreasonable. So we advise our shareholders to vote against this resolution because it's unreasonable because you ask us to take responsibility for the emissions of our customers. We don't know what our customers do with our products. I said, I think they burn it. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they said, they, they literally said it. It's a, the, y the, the follow this resolution, fundamental misunderstanding of the energy transition. transition. It's unreasonable because we cannot take responsibility for scope three. Then some Dutch investors started voting for it. 6% voted for it, then they had to respond. Mm -hmm. Half year later, they made this um, climate ambition and the best, uh, uh, including scope three, this is the emissions yeah. of the customers. Yeah. And then we filed a resolution again because this whole ambition is, is by far not aligned with Paris. And then they said, now the resolution is not, not unreasonable anymore, but now it's <laughs> unnecessary. So that's basically the proof that, yeah. that they, they incorporated our agenda. But, ha yeah, but, has it, but what has changed since September? Because these were changes that were before September. I remember yeah. speaking about this uh, during the preparations. Yeah. Has anything else concretely changed after that interview or just in gen like after September, after we last spoke? Now Shell slowly starts investing in renewables now. 
So that, okay. that's, that, that's the, the, the most important change. Uh, when we started in 2015, the answer on the shareholder meeting was, sorry, we don't do renewables because that's subsidized business. And we do not, sub do, not do subsidized business. Uh, they did nothing. So now they have an ambition and they slowly start investing. But okay. we have to put it in perspective. Yeah. It's 800 million a year. <laughs> And the other 24.2 billion, yeah. so the other 97% still go to oil and gas. Uh, more oil and gas. Yeah. Okay, so you're saying actually quite a small amount of what Shell is spending goes to renewable energy. But on the 7th of April, your company decided to give Shell a year off. Yeah. This seems very contradictory that they're not changing substantially, but yeah. you're deciding to uh, let them get off of pressure. Will Shell then not be less incentivized to quickly make these big changes when they have less immediate pressure from you? Yeah. You sound like me three months <laughs> ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, had exactly the same <laughs> I had exactly the same story. It was, this, was, this was the most difficult decision in, in, the, uh -huh. in the history of Follow This. Let's, uh, it's only a four-year history, but okay. <laughs> this was the most difficult decision I had to make in, in, in the... In, uh, in follow this. Are we going to withdraw? Are we not going to withdraw? And, and that was a decision between principles and strategy. So and what was the strategy uh, behind the decision? The strategy behind it is that Shell uh, has an, uh, is the only oil major with a uh, ambition for scope 3. All the mm -hmm. others have to follow. So we could recognize that. Uh, and we could focus on the others to follow Shell. And meanwhile, keeping the pressure, because the most important reason I withdrew, we withdrew, is that six of the ten biggest Dutch investors who supported us last year have made a very strong statement saying, okay, Shell, you get a year off, but in this year, you have to align your targets with the Paris Climate Agreement. So we recognize that you're an industry leader by setting a target, but this target needs to be aligned with Paris. And, and you're confident that this will happen as well, without the pressure? I think this at this moment the pressure from the six investors is better than the pressure from a shareholder resolution. And at the end of the year we can we can see what Shell has done and then we can decide to file for 2020 again. But it's very important to show the to all the investors that uh, we're not obsessed with shareholder resolutions, we're only upset obsessed with climate change. And we think that it's very good that the six investors and a lot more outside the Netherlands put a lot of pressure on Shell now. Okay, you're Nice step, but you now have to take step one. Meanwhile, we're going to focus on the other oil major to set step, step one, that's committing uh, to a scope three target. We, we think that there are basically three steps. First is to recognize that you are responsible for the emissions of your products. Then you have to, so y uh, you have to set a target for the emissions of your products and, and also recognize that it should be zero by 2050. The second step is aligning the target with Paris, mm -hmm. and the first step is investing accordingly. Looking at Shell, Shell has set step one. This year, they hopefully set uh, s uh, step two, and then they can set step three, is really aligning the investment, because then it should be a lot more than 800 million a year. Okay, I think this is a good moment to turn to the audience, that perhaps they have something to s ask about this. Yes. Yeah, sure. Hi, uh, I'm Lennart, and... Um, there's another type of shareholder activism, which is divestment. Yeah. And a lot of these big investors, like the Norwegian Pension Fund, sorry, um, divest, can you maybe hold it a bit? Yeah, <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, divested from coal companies, because yeah. they simply say, okay, maybe we can engage in other companies, but coal companies are just contradictory to the goals of Paris. Yeah. When are you going to realize that oil companies are exactly in the same category? Because to actually be in line with Paris, we're in a climate crisis. We have to transition much faster than even being carbon uh, neutral by 2050 is not enough. So when do you make oil companies the same as coal companies? I don't know. If we would do it right now, I think they would celebrate <coughs> that, they're off, that they're off the hook uh, from pressure from us. So I don't think we have to do it now. When the moment comes that, that the oil and gas industry is at the same point as the coal industry, I don't know, but it should be quick. But you're, uh, the coal industry has responded far too late. So there, there's divestment there now. Um, but uh, when the oil industry is too late, now difficult to say. Uh, but I think the divestment pressure is also an excellent pressure on the uh, investors uh, to 
to make a choice, either divest or force the companies to change. Is there still another question? Yes, here in the yellow sweater. I was wondering why did you choose to invest in uh, polluting companies instead of companies who are already having a green initiative uh, and make them compete with companies uh, like Shell? Because uh, what I hear is uh, Shell is shareholder driven, so that's uh, kind of power and money related. So you can also make uh, a counter argument that you can make uh, an other company go green and that way force Shell and such companies to uh, change their behavior. Yeah. yeah, so why do you invest in an unsustainable company instead of an already sustainable ones to make yeah. those grow? Because we need the unsustainable companies to, uh, to change quickly. Otherwise, it's we're too late. Normally, a an, an transition like this what normally happens uh, is that the incumbents respond too slow, there, c there are newcomers, and uh, at the end of the day, they wipe away the incumbents. That's what, what normally happens with a transition. And this would also happen here. So the new companies will make new business models uh, and will make the uh, incumbents, the vested companies, uh, redundant, and finally they will go bankrupt. Only with this transition, we cannot afford that because it takes too long. And I think it's very important to invest in, in uh, companies who, uh, who are uh, fully renewable. And I also do that personally. Mm -hmm. But I found this way uh, because I think that the oil industry can really make or break the Paris Agreement. If we leave them alone, they will finally go bankrupt, but it will take far too long and far too much CO2 in the air. So that's why I, f I focus on this. But in the meanwhile, uh, we have to also stimulate, as a consumer, uh, more renewable uh, companies. But it takes, let's take an example here, tonight. we have Current, we have Van der Bron. But it takes too long before these companies are big enough to, uh, uh, to make uh, the Shells and the Exxons and the BPs uh, redundant. I think the industry could have a far bigger impact them. Okay. Uh, newcomers. L l uh, I don't know any company in the Netherlands who can who invests 25 billion a year. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your audience questions. There will be more time for audience questions later in the interview, so <laughs> we'll make sure to give you your turn then. Um, for now, we'd like to move on to the value and the limits of activist investment. Mm -hmm. So, as you already mentioned, follow this is main influence over shells through. Is uh, yeah, thank you. Only six, <laughs> only six point one percent of uh, shareholders yeah. back this at yeah. their peak. Yeah. How influential is this so-called agenda setting really? If Shell can just ignore these measures and these resolutions? No, they have not uh, ignored it. So apparently, okay. it's very effective. Um, six percent apparently was enough for Shell to uh, set climate targets, set ambitions uh, for their products. So yeah. it, it was quite effective. Yeah. Um, I got the example, by the way, from uh, a short-term activist investor in ABN AMRO in 2007, the Children Investment Fund. They only had 1% in ABN AMRO, and they managed to get the company in three into three parts. So with a, f a very small percentage, you can, you can extend a lot of influence. But with this inf if, we, if we try to find a majority, right? Yeah. We try to do some calculations, and at this pace, with 6.1%, yeah. yeah. it will take you another 33 years in order to get the majority. Give it, given the urgency of climate change, don't you think it is, more, it is time to take more radical measures? Yeah. First, I have to tell you, you have that's it completely differs how you uh, project growth. Yeah, I, we, were I, just, we were just looking I at you the things right You now. do it linear. Yeah. I believe, <laughs> in, I believe in exponential growth. Okay. Um, when you, for example, if you look at the cars, in the, the electric cars in the Netherlands, you can say this will take, uh, 100 years before uh, we all, uh, the whole the Netherlands drives electric, if you do it linear. But if you say, okay, uh, the sales doubles every year, we're there before 2030. Um, but apart from that, um, you don't need a majority. Officially, we need 75% to make our resolution legally binding. Uh, 75%. You can only get there when you have management support. But apparently, a few percent is enough to, uh, to extend influence. Okay. So we don't, you don't, as an activist shareholder, you don't need a majority. Okay. 
Well, activist investment is, of course, not the only form of activism out there. Yeah. We also have much more established and conventional forms. So therefore, I would like to ask you, how does activist investment compare to those more conventional forms, mm -hmm. such as, for example, strikes or protests? Complementary, I think. It's, I think, every effort to stop climate change uh, is, uh, is helpful. So these are protests, strikes, the Extinction Rebellion uh, movement, uh, speeches by Greta Thunberg, everything helps. Uh, only I choose this, this way. Okay. Yeah. I mean, previously in, the, in this interview, you mentioned that um, activist investment is the only form of investment to actually get businesses to listen. Do you think that protests and strikes like, f fail compared to... No, no, they help, a, they help a lot by making visible uh, what, these company really, what these companies really do. If you go to a Shell shareholder meeting, there's always Friends of the Earth who takes, somebody, takes an Inuit from invites an Inuit from Alaska telling how his country is devastated by, uh, by the oil exploration. There's um, Greenpeace invites somebody from Nigeria who's telling uh, uh, how, how his country is, is uh, uh, ruined. Um, so NGOs, all NGOs help a lot by making visible what these, what these companies do. Um, and... Um, yeah, everything helps, I think. Uh, every so it, uh, when I started this, I was very much aware that when you have such a, a big goal, uh, you have to make sure you don't end up in fight with other people with the same goal but with different tactics. And I think that's w in, the, cli in the, 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 uh, the fight against climate change is working very, uh, very well. One of my examples is, is Lucy Stone. She was a uh, a fighter for uh, something also ridiculous in the in the 1850s, women's voting rights, and this movement lost uh, uh, lost a lot of time by fights over tactics instead of the end goal, voting rights for women. And I think in the in the climate movement, I think everybody is uh, very much aware that everybody has his own approach. Um, this is my approach. I like to wear a suit and a tie, <laughs> uh, so th this is my approach. But uh, uh, protesting, making very visible what the wrongdoings of companies are, is also very effective. As you mentioned, you, there, are qu there are quite a lot of attentions, I suppose. And you can we well, you know, well, we are aware that there are of course tensions between protesters and businesses. Mm -hmm. So we were curious about whether these tensions or whether these same these same th things hold for activist investors and businesses too. D have you ever felt like you were treated as an enemy by Shell or its employees? Yeah, they try to uh, they f they try to to place us in that in uh, in that uh, part because yeah. the, the they also tell that to investors. Uh, although our resolution our resolution is formulated very clear, y Shell does support the company to set targets. We support you to uh, change your business, and we always end with, you have our support. Shell choose to go to their shareholders saying, you have to support us, Shell, by voting against that resolutions. Re resolution. I know from Dutch investors who voted for our resolution got calls from Shell saying, mm. you voted against us. So Shell made this a kind of, although we very much try to uh, um, Communica communicate and also yeah. mean it that we organize Shell to support. The oil industry is, uh, and, and this is what other oil majors where we now filed resolutions has done as well, make it a kind of controversy. Uh, and, and that's yeah, that's not helpful, of so course. So would you say then there's more cooperation or more competition between you and Shell right now? Um, yeah, now we're maybe we're on even, uh, on par, I think. Yeah, yeah we, talk, so, a so we talk a lot with Shell. They have... They have Basically, th there's cooperation in the sense that the, the net carbon footprint they have now, yeah. that's, that was our ID. So uh, there's a lot of cooperation, and I think slowly. Uh, they also appreciated that we, we withdrew our resolution this year. Um, that was also the wish of Shell. Yeah. So I think that's, that's we, we are now a step further with that. Yeah. So we cannot speak of a big best friendship between you and Ben van Brody yet? Uh, I'm afraid not. <laughs> no, no, no. All right. So... 
but I, but I guess once that does happen, mm. I suppose once there is more cooperation, yeah. that is th th that is a value for the business. And do you think that there's other values to activist in that activist investment and activist investors can bring to businesses? Yeah, I think they can bring a more diversity in their decision making process. So uh, it's important that they have investors who say, okay, the world. Uh, the world doesn't need oil and gas in 2050, we can go over to renewables. So that's, uh, it's very telling that our resolution was um, advised, uh, advised our shareholders to vote against the resolution, that it was a unanimous decision. This means the whole board believes that we still need oil and gas in 2100. Yeah. So uh, there's also a lot of pressure from investors, not especially from us, that the board of the oil and gas major also get people who have a big expertise in renewables and in uh, new business models to get these people in the boards. And would you say that there's also negative things that um, activist invest, I, I guess, what, what that activist investment brings mm -hmm. to businesses? No, I don't think so. No? When you talk about long-term activist investors like we are, I think it's, okay. uh, uh, yeah, we have at least made, uh, with thanks to the support of a lot of shareholders, we, we made Shell uh, change course. Yeah. But the, the negative uh, part of activist investors are the short-term focus. Mm -hmm. So what you see with Unilever, what you saw with AB and AMRO. So there's a lot of short-term activism, mm -hmm. and they are focused on making a profit in the next quarter. Um, and uh, at the cost of uh, a longer-term future. Okay. But if we look at a longer-term future as well, a study by the, by, uh, the University of British Columbia uh, found out that, um, let me just read it out from here. Re so that green activist investment campaigns actually lead to underinvesting by targeted firms, which leads to um, then a lower total investment into mm -hmm. the economy. And looking at it from like a long-term perspective, I suppose, isn't that a negative side from activist that investment? Could, I though? don't know that survey. So what do they exactly say? Well, short basically, term, the, yeah. short term investment, no, sh no uh, activist investors. Yeah, so activist investors lead to under investing um, by targeted firms, yeah. which then leads to a, a lower total net investment in the economy. Yeah, I think that, yeah, I would say that goes for short term activist okay. investors. So, what so short term. not for follow this either. No, no, because we, I don't think the investment Shell does today have any influence of, o over the next quarter, but they have influence over their business model in the next uh, decades. But I think, I did, I, uh, again, I don't know the study, but, yeah. but thinking about it quickly, I think that I mean that what short-term investors do is say, okay, uh, for example, you, sp you invest five million a year, one million, uh, no, you invest, they say to the company, you invest five billion a year, we think for the next year, one billion is enough, you give the four billion back to the shareholders. So that's, so I think that that's what they mean with that survey. Okay. Well, I suppose, um, I mean, in that same study, they also mentioned that because of activist investment or activist inve investment groups, companies tend to hide behind closed doors. And you also mentioned this as well, that some, some activist investors and that some um, people actually prefer to not let these big fights spill out into the public. Yeah. Do you think that this is a good development? No, I don't think so. I think no. we need transparency. And, and we've seen what this engagement behind closed doors have led to. Uh, let's take 2006, Inconvenient Truth, as a kind of year that everybody was aware we needed action. 2006. In 2015, nothing was achieved. This oil, big oil companies were still investing money in uh, more oil and gas. So I think this behind closed doors, um, um, yeah, doesn't ha does isn't really effective. Okay, but how do you make sure that that doesn't happen with Follow This and Shell? Uh, because if they don't get, uh, if they don't sharpen their uh, uh, their their net carbon footprint ambition, their, their targets for Scope Three this year, we have to file again. So, uh, and and then next year in 2020, it will be again very visible uh, what the choices of Shell and their investors okay. are. So I think that this is very important. Uh, a shared resolution is a very imp important tool to make things visible. Okay. And when we speak about visibility, we can also speak about these proxy fights and journalism again. And yeah. I was, yeah, I, I was just wondering whether 
you as a journalist or as a former journalist, yeah. sorry, <laughs> whether you think that it is actually less productive to have these, um, to have these proxy fights spill out into the public. Do you think that this can hinder the company? I don't think so. I, I think the proxy vote is the only visible, uh, uh, visible instructions uh, shareholders give to the company. So, uh, and I don't think, I think calling it a proxy fight is, uh, is, is not really uh, productive. It's like, okay. it's like an election. Uh, we don't call the election a fight. We just call it an election. So what should we call it instead? Just, uh, just a normal fight. Yeah, let's call it an election. Okay. Uh, it's just, just, there's something very simple on the, on, the, on, the, on the agenda. Please commit yourself to the Paris Climate Agreement. And all shareholders can vote for it. And then it's very visible. Okay, some shareholders are for the short term. They're against it. Shareholders for the long term are for it. That, that would be the ideal situation. In, the, uh, in real life, uh, investors found it very difficult to vote against management. The higher you get up in an organization, the more sensitive you become. <laughs> so you can now tell me right away what you think of me, but if I would be the CEO of Shell the, or, or another company, uh, I could be difficult. offended. Okay. Um, and, and, that's, uh, and that's because everything uh, what is said by an investor about the company can can have an implication on the on the stock exchange. So I, I understand that, but it's uh, the tradition is to do everything behind closed doors, and and I think we break with that tradition. What what we basically do the unwritten rules are uh, not to do this in public, and but we don't we only play by the rules and not by the unwritten rules. All right. So we already mentioned before that you are maybe sometimes seen as an enemy by Shell, even though arguably you are doing very good things. However, we see this backlash against activist investors increasing very much. Mm -hmm. So last month in the US, the US Securities and Exchange Commission actually supported ExxonMobil by trying to throw out a shareholder resolution on climate, yeah. which made sure that this resolution was completely off the table. No one could vote for it anymore. Yeah. What can activist investors do against these kind of institutionally backed backlashes? Yeah, hopefully hire better lawyers. Uh, <laughs> because <laughs> this is, a, yeah, I don't want to say anything about the lawyers who, who defended this case, but this, this was a ridiculous decision. Uh, because it's, uh, this resolution was a replication of the follow this resolution uh, for Shell. So it also yeah. asked for uh, Paris aligned targets for scope one, two, and three. So for emissions of operations and products. And, sh and Exxon, the arguments Exxon used was it was micromanagement, yeah. which is a kind of strange argument. Do you, think that do you think it's a valid reason or just not at all? No, it's sort of no the strange thing is that, that uh, in their response, uh, Exxon said it's too vague and it's micromanagement. So these are quite, this is quite contradiction. And, and, and I was very surprised that the, the Security and Exchange Committee uh, bought that ar two arguments. But, uh, the last thing is not said about that because there are now more and more investors who want to vote against the board of uh, ExxonMobil for excluding that resolution. But so do you think that the fact that ExxonMobil gets away with these vague arguments shows the kind of power, the lobby power that these big companies yeah, have? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they have an enormous lobby power. That's, 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 that's for clear. So they don't want to respond to climate change and they manage to get it off the agenda. Um, but I don't think this will last for long. So, so next year there will be. This, the good thing is now the, the follow this resolution is on the agenda of uh, BP, Equinor, uh, Chevron in a somewhat uh, light version. Um, um, and at uh, ExxonMobil it was uh, filed but rejected. But the good thing it was filed by very big institutional investors. So the institutional investors are now slowly replicating our uh, request which they two years ago still called unreasonable because of this scope tree. So, so the, the movement in the right direction is, is, uh, uh, is there. The only question is, the, is, it, is it fast enough? Okay, so you don't think that these backlashes are inevitable because of this lobby power? Yeah, apparently they are inevitable, inevitable uh, because of lobby power and, and, and we should m find a way to also lobby uh, with the SEC, uh, so I don't think this will they will pull this trick another year. <laughs> okay, so yeah. just start hiring the lawyers then. 
No, I don't want to say anything about <laughs> the lawyers. No, no, I think, I think that apparently the, the SEC, let's say the SEC has, apparently not people who, who yeah, put enough intellectual discipline in it. And by intellectual discipline, I, I mean thinking longer than two seconds about it. They need a long-term. Uh, they need long -term to, to think longer about it. It's, 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 it's very, and, and I think there will be a lot of debate about this decision because okay. it's, it's a very strange decision because the, the resolution is completely business model and technology agnostic. It's not sitting in the driver's seat of the board, so the, the micromanagement argument is, is very strange. So there's something else at play here. And uh, what do you think would be at play here then? I think the lobby power and, and the influence of these companies. Uh, apparently also over the SEC. Okay. Yeah. I think that this is a nice point to move to the audience again. I see yeah. that there are a couple of hands. Um, over there, there's... George Banker. Um, two questions. Um, could you please comment your on your view towards the um, lawsuit against Shell? And the other one, uh, if w one of us or all of us would uh, buy one share of a company, uh, how would it uh, support your struggle? Okay, thank you. Yeah, about this court case, of course, as a shareholder, I have to say, this is a waste of money. Uh, for Friends of the Earth, who do the court case, and for Shell as well. But I think it's also a very good way to put pressure on these companies. It's not the way I've chosen, uh, but it's a very good way to put pressure on the, uh, on the companies. And, and I think they have a very good case, only, uh, only uh, I'm afraid it will take long. But the case is very strong, they have a very good lawyer, Roger Cox, so they will eventually win the case. The only question is how, if it's quick enough. And by the way, they use Shell's rejection of our resolution as a kind of exhibit A uh, to prove that Shell is not willing to act on climate change. So this, this is again, this is complementary. And um, joining, follow this as a movement. Yeah, it's very important that we can show the industry that we are a growing movement, that we, we grow to 5,000 and then to 10,000, and that more and more people uh, are willing to buy one share to influence these companies. Uh, so it's very important in our communication that we can tell the, the investment world we have 5,000, we have 10,000 members, they all have a pension, maybe with you, and they all want this change, so why not you? So this helps a lot. So thank you for, for, for giving me that opportunity, but whoever has not a green share in Shell yet, has anybody a green share in Shell in this audience? Ah, oh, okay. Okay. So whoever has not, go to our <laughs> website. <laughs> oh, for, okay, you can also give it as a present, yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can always, if you're fed up with it, you can always sell it. It's your share, uh, so uh, it's, it's your share. You can always, sh you can always sell it. A dividend is for you. Um, but uh, you can. The, the nice thing would be that that Shell gets a lot of emails from st young students who say, "Okay, I'm your shareholder because I think you." Uh, I think you should change, and you have my support. And if you really change, I maybe I may want to work for you. Well, maybe for <laughs> mothers. Sorry? Yeah, by becoming a member of Follow This, you basically are a shareholder in all these five companies um, with smaller amount. With Shell, it was very easy because it's 30 euros. Um, but it, by becoming a member of Follow This, you are basically shareholder in, in now in five oil and gas majors. All right. Are there any? Oh, yeah, the guy with the glasses. Um, activism against climate change is a noble goal, but how do you justify that but at the same time being a shareholder, getting dividend back uh, from these gas companies and uh, pushing the prices off of the stocks of these gas companies, so in uh, partly rewarding them for being uh, terrible for the earth? Are there any moral boundaries of how to use the dividend or anything like that? Yeah, of course, we use the dividend for our movement, so that's at least a good cause. Uh, but yeah, you're right. It's a very, it's it's a very uh, counterintuitive uh, thing to do to become a shareholder of a, of an oil and gas major. Um, I also would prefer, uh, if they didn't need to change, it would be better to leave them alone. But I think they, without support, without a lot of pressure from the public, from the shareholders, they will not change, and we will end up with in a 
three, four, five degrees world with devastating climate change. So I think we need to um, make them accountable as a shareholder. So it's a pragmatic solution. Yeah, yeah, let's call it pragmatic, yeah. But it's counterintuitive, that's right. Uh, I think uh, uh, your intuition would say, leave them, uh, leave them alone and never buy from them. But that's, uh, I think that will take too long. There was one more question in that corner I also saw. First of all, thank you for your initiative. I think it carries a lot of hope, but I can also imagine that it doesn't really make everyone happy. So my question is, are there any forces that try to put sticks on your wheels? And if so, what are they? So, sorry, can you repeat your question? Are there any forces that try to put sticks in your wheels? that try to uh, stop you or so are there forces make it harder? In a change like this, the forces against you are always the people who want to keep things the same as yesterday. Yeah, that, that's always with big transitions. That the, uh, the vested interests are more interested in their own short-term gains than in the long-term uh, future of, of uh, the rest of the world. Uh, this is always in every transition. So, uh, yeah, we have uh, the opposition is, thi this transition is, is not that difficult. The technology is there, uh, so it we, can, we can easily go to a, uh, an energy supply which is clean, which gets cheaper all the time, which we don't have to get from uh, dictators, we don't have to bribe people for it, we can just get it uh, from the sun. So it's, and it will be cheaper as well. So it's for the long term, it's, it's better for everybody. And the only people who are blocking that change, and that's with every transition, are the people who think they have a short-term benefit from keeping the status quo. Yeah, th so that's the biggest opposition. Kay. And one more question. Final question. <laughs> um, like the question of is it uh, fast enough is a reoccurring thing, and I'm just wondering, APCC says 11 years. Your first resolution was in 2011, and right now Shell is 95% still fossil fuels. Yeah. Do you think that this is going to make the difference? It has to make a difference. That's the only, way, that's the only reason I do, I'm doing this. It has to make a difference, because uh, you're right, we have 11 years, and I think it's less, because if uh, next 11 years uh, oil and gas major put all these billions in making even a bigger infrastructure in oil and gas, we're, we end up with, uh, with an energy system which is uh, difficult to change. So, yeah, we, I think the most, uh, most people in the world realize that we only have a few years to, to change course. Uh, only the, the, the top, I think the, the, the biggest problem is in, in, the, in the management of these big companies. And imagine yourself being a director of Shell this means you have been very successful in oil and gas for 35 years, and then suddenly people tell you, we have to stop that. That's a difficult, that's a difficult decision. Um, but we have to, and, and you're right, we have only a few years. The rules are how you, I mean with the rules is uh, how you file a shareholder resolution. Uh, but I don't play by the written rules which say, you only f file a shareholder resolution af after you've talked to them for 10 years. These are the unwritten rules. So you think it's better to make a change within the system than to overhaul the entire system? Now we have to overhaul the entire system, but... Uh, but you are sticking to the, the rules. Uh, so we have to stick to the rules of the investors how to file a shareholder resolution, but, but uh, That's about it. we're not sticking to the unwritten rules, which says as soon as... Uh, the CEO of the company offers you one cup of coffee and he mentions the word sustainability one, one time, you leave him alone for a couple of years. Uh, mm -hmm. We want result. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for those audience questions. I think this is actually a nice way to move on to the future because we do want to touch upon the future of activist investment. Mm -hmm. What branches, I mean, right now it's mainly climate change. What branches do you think will be tackled next by activist investors? Um, I think in general, uh, activist investors or responsible investors should help companies to focus on the long term. I think Unilever would be helped by investors like us. Okay. Um, 
And I think it's, it's better for everybody if companies focus on long term. Better for the company, better for the world, better for the economy. So we have to help companies uh, to, uh, to focus on the long term. And yeah, I'm but do you follow, think th follow this is focused on climate change, yeah. but there are so many other things which would help diversity in the, in the board, uh, a smaller pay gap, uh, less pollution, um, uh, don't do business with uh, in, in, in states uh, or at least try to influence states with, with strange laws. There's so many other things which for the long term would be a lot better and uh, I think yeah, shareholders could help uh, with that and I think the reasons this is going to succeed is that shareholders also have a long term interest. Okay. Like I'm doing this out of a moral cause but I get the support of investors who uh, think there's a very a big financial incentive for them to stop, uh, to stop climate change. And this is with all other changes. So for the long term, um, if we have stopped climate change, uh, let's hope we do that w uh, within a few years or we know that, that, that we are on the right track on the well below two degree pathway, if we could focus on other long term uh, issues because I mm -hmm. think companies are really helped with long term shareholders. Okay, so we now know a bit more about long term in general of activist yeah. investment but you were also wondering about follow this specifically yeah so what will be the future of follow this will it stay within shell and climate change or will it move somewhere completely different now we uh, for the moment we focus on the entire oil industry we think the entire oil industry needs to change and that's the most important issue to be to be fixed mm -hmm. uh, in the near future but uh, we've shown with Shell that it works. We now have to show with other oil majors that it works. We have one oil major has to break, break ranks and really start investing differently. And if investors and, share, uh, investors and customers reward it, the others will follow. That's basically in short theory of change. But if that's done, if we have proven that long-term um, um, shareholdership works, for the better, uh, yeah, we could we could also ex uh, expand that on other uh, on other issues. Like what other? Yeah. yeah. Like what issues? Yeah, like well, I just said, uh, diversity. I think is very important. Um, pollution in general. Uh, make sure companies really go to a circular circular economy uh, model. Uh, these are just a few examples. Uh, uh, women's rights across the world uh, yeah you, you name it uh, um, i think the the yeah for the long term th this change is like it's like the end of slavery it's like women's voting rights uh, the end of apartheid these are all things which are better for the economy because uh, if you have more uh, equal chances for everybody that's also good for the world economy if uh, if it's not 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 a happy few who can have a university degree so there are a lot of things which are f beneficial for the long term but then we have to focus not on the next quarter but on the next okay. generation okay well i think that we will uh, come back to that in the next generation then as well um before we give our guest a warm round of applause i just like to mention a few things which is that tomorrow we actually have another interview with uh, the minister of foreign trade and Development Cooperation, Sigrid Kaag, on the future of humanitarian aid and trade. So make sure to join that. And on Friday, um, renowned historian Adam Tuz is coming. And um, we hope that you join that as well. I'd also like to mention that we have a new newsletter. So <laughs> please <laughs> subscribe to the newsletter. Make sure to follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook. And of course, you can watch this uh, interview back on our YouTube channel and listen to it on our, <laughs> on our podcast. As many times as you <laughs> want. As <laughs> many times as you want. But for now, please give our guests a warm round of applause. Thank you so much. <laughs>